Hello, us. welcome, us. us. Hey, Mitch. Hello. Always good to see you. Always good to have Mitch here. Um, just moving a little bit. Us. So today we're looking at uh, we're continuing the series of um, the fine detail of the Kihon techniques. So we have thirty Kihon techniques, uh, and we're going to over time cover as many as we can. Uh, the kicks are always a problem because there are certain things I can't do with my knees anymore, but Mitch has got good kicks for an old fella, so we'll work something out. Um, but anyway, uh, today we're looking at uh, Seiken and Udaken. So sometimes people wonder whether doing all the basics uh, is time efficient. You know, Sosa was really adamant about Kihon and the importance of doing Kihon. And like if you saw the... Uh, if you saw the um, video blog of, of uh, the Marshall Way last week with, with yeah. Todd and Terry, they interviewed uh, uh, Judd and Nick, and they both had some interesting things to say. But as as Nick pointed out, Hongbu was never really a very creative place to train. If you wanted to get creative and focus on specific tournament fighting training and so on, well, most of them did it by themselves. Okay. Um, but training was essentially just focused all the time on Kihon, 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 Kihon. But what does Kihon mean? You know, well, we've discussed this. My theory of Kihon is any training that you can do that prepares you for the real event. So essentially, all training is Kihon, Kihon. training, which means now you have to process that. What does it exactly actually mean? I'm thinking it's a similar thing. And keep in mind always the Shingi Tai, all right? Um, Shingi Tai, where's my... Shingi Tai gives you... Um, uh, Mind-body technique. So there are three aspects. And in, in, in many respects, uh, Ian King also talks about um, tactics as well. And that's particularly important for some sports, right? For a lot of sports, yeah, yeah, definitely. The more technical the sport or where there's lots of people involved, team yes. sports, it's yes. huge. I see the tactic side of it. When I used to coach rugby league, tackling, the tactics involved in every aspect was really important or were really important. And that's because it's a team sport. So everybody in the team has to be on the same page. They have to know what they're doing tactically. Yeah, or they might be targeting another player. And yes. so everyone con contributes to doing that. Right. Yeah, so I think, is it fair to say that tactics is important in most sports, but particularly in team sports? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Some sports is no tactics, really. I mean, if you're doing clay shooting, hit as many target targets, targets as you can. As you can. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, you, don't, you don't want to miss the first target, yeah. and, and we'll just hit the second one. Yeah. 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 True. I have a, a good buddy, Michael Diamond. He, he won gold yeah. medals. At a couple of Olympics, his last Olympics, I was watching it, and uh, he he broke, he'd equal the world record. He was far and away, hadn't missed a target until the finals, and then he hadn't missed a target until the last four shots of the final. And if he got those, would have won the gold medal. Wow! And I spoke to him later, and he told me, "See what happens in target shooting? That the play target shoots out straight, left, or right." And it's random. But I guess if you shoot a million targets, you'll start to tune in to the random randomness. And he said before the fourth last shot, he just knew exactly where it went. And because he knew, his reaction timing was a fraction second faster. And because it was a fraction second faster, he missed the, the target. target. And that blew his mind. He, just, he was so pissed off that he, he went from being in first place and the favourite to losing a playoff a third place it came fourth wow yeah in four shots yep incredible amazing so um there is no tactic tactical uh approach to something like play shooting no just get the targets <laughs> yeah but most sports even individual ones will have a degree of tactics yes um and even in sports like powerlifting and olympic lifting you're doing things uh, you've got your attempts, but even sometimes, depending who else is lifting and they know the other weights, they can play games with that tactically. 100%. There's so, a lot of it's like, stuff. Yeah, yeah. In, in sports. So mm. it's, it's quite interesting the deeper you get into sports, the more you can see what's going on in those areas too, which you, you've been exposed to. A lot. Even in Kyokushin, you know, you see uh, the world tournament and you'll have um, 
the way you approach the early rounds and, and certain fighters is different to the way you approach later rounds. rounds. And if you're if you're particularly if you particularly want to work a uh, particular technique which you don't think people have seen or you'd rather they didn't see, well, against the lesser opponents, you won't use, use it. it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of tactics in karate as well. Brad, my commiserations. That was so sad to hear about uh, Keith. Um, very sad and very must be a real shock for you and his family. So my condolences. Uh, Keith Owen, our buddy Brad Hansen. Keith Owen's a very highly regarded BJJ instructor in America, and he passed away very suddenly just a few days ago. So very sad. Okay, so today we're looking at, um, like I said, continuing the Kihon, and especially the Seiken and Uraken. Seiken, there's only a couple of Seiken techniques we do uh, in regular Kihon practice, Chudanski, Jodanski. It's interesting because the Seiken finish with the word ski, chudan ski, whereas uraken is uchi. So one's a strike, one's a punch. What's the difference? Well, I always work, the, the way that I process the difference between chudan ski and uchi strike is that one is an impactive explosive strike. So you, you actually want the opponent to fall straight down because there's been this explosion of kinetic energy. Oof. Whereas at ski, I always work the idea, like Masayama said, it's very, very gruesome, but very poetic. He would punch with his soul in his hand and aim to snap the spine of his opponent and pull the spine out. So that's a difference. That's what a ski means. You're going to drive in, drive through the target, whereas Uchi, Uraken, Gamme uchi, sai uchi, hizo uchi, is an explosive strike. Okay, so seiken, we understand seiken. Everyone knows seiken. Um, the older you get, the more difficult it is, especially when you get um, arthritis. Ideally, you want to bend your fingertips above the heart line. See that line there? I'll put it, I'll mark it with a pen. That's the, if you're a palm reader. That's the heart line, you see? So you want your fingertips to always be above the heart line when you fold your knuckles. And the whole idea of that is to squeeze the blood out of your hand. If you have movement in your hands, you have weakness in your fist. And there's a famous Japanese uh, karate master, Nakamura Hideo, um, one of Soul Size contemporaries. And he had a beautiful saying, which I love. Kitae no karata kobushi wa kono, uh, sono shunkan tekken, uh, tekko ni naru. So the trained fist in the instant becomes steel. And it's, it's so true. And the way you, you want to do that, and it's defied. I mean, there are so many uh, discussions and you know, tests done where they just can't work out how a human hand being flesh and blood can break through things like a couple of bricks or even, you know, it's, so there's something special about being able to make a strong fist. So tighten, close with the thumb, squeeze your little finger and ring, ring uh, thumb together, tighten so you see how the hand kind of starts to go white. If I let it off, the color comes back. If I squeeze the blood and, and you strike with the seiken, you strike with the seiken, but here's the key. The body weight is concentrated one sun or one, basically one inch behind this joint and this joint there. So that's where your body weight is uh, focused. Now, I found that really interesting when Solsai taught that. He said, the place you strike is here, but the place you concentrate your weight is there. And if you've never thought about that or never done it, play with it because you'll be amazed at what it does. Would you play with that in sparring, makiwara training? In makiwara, always in makiwara. And also what it does, which I think is really key, is forces you to squeeze in the little finger. And the little finger, even when you grab a gi, for example, or grab someone, you don't grab with the 
the upper, the, the forefinger. You tend to grab with the little finger. I'll use this hand so you can see. You grab with the little finger and this one starts to float a little bit and that way it won't get caught, but it's very strong. And even uh, Randy Couture once told me that what he does is when he grabs someone, he squeezes with the little finger. Then he'll, if he's holding someone for a long time, you know what it's like when you grab with your hands, just burn up. Oops, yeah. So then he might change with the focus on the forefinger. Mm -hmm. Then he might change with the focus on the ring finger. And then he might change with the focus on the middle finger. So he's constantly playing a guitar yeah. whilst he's holding. And that way it used to give his hands small. Degrees. A little more energy. Yeah, a little yes. energy, but also rest in between. I want to ask you about body conditioning. I saw in the video there's your hand conditioning. So can you make a video about full body conditioning, hand shins? Yes, we talk about this to a degree. We've done a lot of that in the, uh, the Buddha Blueprint, Blueprint. app. Oops. Yeah, we did some great body conditioning work. I work basically on five fundamental body conditioning drills. Uh, and they're all in that. And the Maki wire on the hand is one of them. Okay, so we're going to look at, at Seiken and Udaken. And we want to be accurate with them. All right, so let's have a look at that now. Oh, you probably leave that there and we'll just go behind them. We've got visitors, look. Yeah, how about that? Okay, so I'll get, we'll, we'll, we'll work together from here. You right? Those Miggy's hands in, that's it. You right? Come on, Deb. Good. So the hands, the wrist, the shoulder height. The elbow is in line with the inside of the body. The inside of the hand is in line with the outside of the elbow. So remember, there's real estate out there which you pay taxes. Let the government deal with whatever's outside your body line. Keep everything within the body line. That's a really good habit. The other thing about that that is really important is that if you can keep it inside your body line, it's harder to see. Okay, because a foot coming over there is much harder to see when it's within the line of your body. Okay, so both hands out, right hand back. So also used to say, what is the best height? And I find this really intriguing that a lot of styles are down here. And I 100% recognize that they probably have good argument for it. You know, it's relaxed and that sort of thing. But I often watch video of these other styles. But first there's sport and non-sport. Okay, in non-sport karate, quite often what will happen is if the hands relax, they'll bring it up first to throw the punch. In sport karate, where it's all about style and points and impression, they'll often go, throw the punch, and then they, yeah, they'll come back here. Yeah. You never see them go, nah, down here as much as back here. So it's interesting. I think there's something in it. And it's also, of course, that retraction, bringing it back here too, pulls the, uh, Shoulder blades together and pulls the elbow in. So also, it's always adamant. You don't want to see the elbow from the front. So if I'm here and my elbow is out, it means I haven't created the correct arc of tension through the body. On the scapular attraction, yes. the hand back. From, from a stretch shortening point of view, if you're here or a force development point of view, in generally speaking, the longer a muscle is, the more force. And, and, and the better the contraction will be. And so if you're from here trying to develop force versus up here, it's significantly different. I remember I did Shotokan karate for years before Kyo Shin, and we used to not stand, we just stand in like basically yoi and punch like this. No criticism, it's just what we did. But then when we come to Kyo, I came to Kyo Shin and we're up here, and I was thinking, oh, just, just, so it's that one. Yeah, yeah. so the, 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 this being up here from a stretch shortening point of view. And, and if you didn't hear what Mitch said, he said scapular retraction which is the scapula back here, the shoulder blade, the scapula retraction. This high hand pulls the scapula back with the tight elbow. Down here, there's very little scapula retraction. And from a stretch shortening point of view too, if you're doing it here versus up here, the force generation is a lot greater from here because we're, we're lengthening. So there's more of a, a re reactive, equal and opposite reaction during the contraction. I, always, I used to be intrigued by uh, uh, Storyu was the style of Storyu, particularly Taniha Storyu. They had a really beautiful double motion and they have this sort of flowing motion. Bam! They really generate a lot of power. The problem is it takes a little bit longer. So, you know, it, uh, anyway, that's, it is what it is. But they had a similar thing where they, this triple 
this trip on hip movement if you master it, it's really beautiful. So say can to the ski, we're aiming always down the center line. And we're aiming at the solar plexus, the solar plexus just below the sternum. That's a good place to hit. Another good place to hit is just under the heart in the spleen. Okay. Uh, anywhere under the ribs, down low in the back bladder for street fights. Nothing beats a good kick to the, the, the bladder. Just kick them on their belt. If they've got jeans on, they usually have a belt on. Kick them on the belt, and that's usually just at the bladder, and they've been drinking beer all night. So generally speaking, it's as good as a hit in the solar plexus. I kid you not. Okay, so we're there. One, two. Notice the elbow is not visible from the front. Three, four. The next thing is, watch my hand. Watch our back hand. It stays upside down all the way out, and then twist at the end. This is really important that you get your students to develop that habit. You can even start slowly doing this. You don't want to let them turn over first and then punch. Look what happens. Turn over first, elbow visible, come out, arm punch, not body punch. I want to keep my elbow in, hand up, twist. And that's really good too. If you get used to that, that little twist on the end, when you're in street fights and stuff, that little twist on the end can really serve to carve the skin as well. So, bitch, me, son, see we're pulling the elbow back in, the hand stays upside down right until the end. Sheep, bitch, me, son, she. Okay? Jordan ski, Jordan, it means Jordan. So, Here's what I say to the students at the dojo. Jordan is pretty well anything above there. So where do you hit? You hit the face. Where do you hit? No, you actually hit the chin. No, you hit the pimple in the middle of the chin. No, you hit the dimple. No, you hit the pimple in the middle of the dimple. No, you hit the hair growing out of the middle of the pimple in the dip, dimple in the middle of the chin in the head. No, you actually aim for the split end of the hair of the pimple and the dimple on the jaw of the head. So why do we do that? Because if I'm aiming, the finer the detail, the clearer the process, remember that. If I'm aiming for the split hair and I miss it, I'll hit the pimple. But if I miss the pimple and I miss it, I'll hit the dimple. If I miss the dimple and I hit it, I'll hit the jaw. If I miss the jaw, aim for the jaw and miss it, I'll hit the head. If I aim for the head and miss it, what do I hit? Trouble. Trouble. I hit nothing. Okay, so it's always really important that you refine the targeting down to as fine a point as you can possibly uh, remember. Okay, jawline, we're aiming right on the tip of the jaw or tip of the nose, that's okay, as long as you know where you're hitting in jawline. Same, exactly the same thing. One, we hand twist right at the end. Two, three, four, five, Six. Okay, so Jordan ski, the important thing here is always scapular retraction, the retraction of the elbow. What is the correct height? Well, the correct height is the natural height there. We, this is how you measure the height for uh, Sayuti, by the way. But you want to lift it up without causing excessive tension through the shoulder. It's relaxing the, the waki, pull it back. And there's your height, nice and tight there. Okay, one, two, three, four. Good. Remember, relax the shoulder, close the waki, arm stays in, twist at the end, aims exactly for the correct target. Okay, Udakem, thanks. So we'll just talk about Udakem for a sec. Um, one of the things that I love about karate is multiple angle. So if someone's there, a good uraken does the job of having to turn around and throw the punch. I can throw here, I can throw there. I can hit there and hit there. So these techniques that we learn, uraken, shto techniques, koken, tetsui, shto, uh, uraken, and so on, are all really practical for different angles and so on. Now, uraken. I find it to be incredibly powerful. Cutting out there, Mitch. That's okay. That's... Getting jealous, all the fan mail I get. Ha! 
to Mitch, care of Cameron. Urakan, we're taught to flick it, okay? And the reason is it reduces the, the point of impact, okay? So the smaller the impact, the more uh, impression it'll make. And also it adds a little bit of speed. Now, having said that, when I practice hard uraken on the makiwara or when I've done hard uraken breaks, I don't flick anything. I keep my hand integrated. There is, it's really important. Now, if I'm hitting something light, like if you're, if you're back fisting a nose, if you're back fisting an eyebrow, that's when the flick comes in because you want that percussion, that percussive explosiveness. But if I'm hitting something hard like a body, everything stays integrated. You want the whole wrist and hand to be solid. And so when I actually hit something hard, I'm not going to bend anything. I want my wrist to stay strong. And if I have a strong fist, it's, it's, you try it. It's, it's really hard to bend your wrist up and down if, if the fist is tight. Try it. Interesting. You squeeze the fist really tight. Mm. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. See how it's actually relaxed? Look, boom, 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 boom. Tighten. It's much harder. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think the Uraken, it's really interesting because Uraken works straight over the top to the side and around in a circle. So you need to get the angles, just like Shto has particular angles, you need to get the angles correct for the uh, Uraken as well. Okay, take a stance. Good. So, Uraken Gammen Uts. Notice the hands together but not touching. It's also with Adam and you have the thickness of a piece of paper in between. Why? Because when you get lazy and tired, you bring your hands down. You see fighters all the time. They get lazy, the first thing they do is they rest their hands on each other. And as soon as you do that, everything goes to sleep. So you've got to keep your hands, keep the arms controlling your hands. Don't let your hands rest. Trust me, you can just relax your hands there and everything changes. So never let your hands touch each other. Okay, you shoot out, shoot out, shoot out, shoot out, and then flick. This one, I love the flick on this one if you're going to go over the nose on the gin, gin tail. I think this point here, or the eye, you hit, flick someone there, let it open up their eye, let the blood run in their eyes, very salty, slows them down, flicks them up. Okay, right hand, one, Good. Two, three, look, back. Lead out. Now, what do I do? You see, some people I look from the side here, some people do this. Roll. It's, it's crazy. What I like to do is I actually lead with the elbow first. You see, I get my elbow vertical and then flick it at the end. Lead with the elbow first. Flick. Lead with the elbow first. Flick. Leave it the elbow, flick, not this way. It's just, you've only got to do a few of them this way to realize it's hard to build up kinetic energy when you're throwing your hand out like that. One of the big problems of doing the Kihon and Kyokushin is they're done too slowly. We get in that, but what you need to do is treat it like an ECG. You're relaxed and then <coughs> quick and then relaxed again. But what most people do is they fill the time available. So I'm sitting going, itch, knee, sun, knee. They'll go, itch, knee, sun, and they'll slow it down and they'll fill up the time available. You don't want to do that. And that's particularly true with Uda camp. So when you do the Uda camp, you hear the, the sound, your brain says it has already finished the technique. Okay, we're here, and itch. You want to get it as quick as you can. Me, son, chi. Remember, the whole idea of uchi, uraken gamen uchi, is to explode on the target. You want to hit the target, and they, if they're unconscious, they fall forward. You don't want to hit the target and send them flying backwards. You want to hit the target and let them drop unconscious. And if they don't drop unconscious, there's a little explosion and there's blood and everything. Okay, that's what you want. So, Sayuchi, what's the correct height for the Sayuchi? A lot of people go too high here. 
puts tension in the shoulder. 90% of all problems, according to so-and-so, in karate is excessive tension in the shoulders. So we relax the arms. Good. We come out to Chudan Ski, withdraw the hand. Now withdraw the other hand. Now keep the shoulders relaxed and bring the hands together. That is the height of Sayuj. There. There. Not up here. If you can't keep that same height and put it under your armpit, it's too high. Oh, okay. Relax. Pull it back. There's your height. Once again, don't let the hands touch. They're just like, you can feel that. I can feel my hair on my fingers, but I don't let the hand touch. Okay, now this one, lead with the elbow and flick. One, two, three. When I say lead with the elbow, the reason I do that is Urakin Game is the elbows down. So it's a different leading. With this one, the elbow is up. So you see a lot of people do this. That's doing Urakin Game Uti, but you're doing it to the side. It's a different technique. Remember, when we do all the 30 basics, we're training all the muscles of the, the, the entire body. Okay, so there's a reason why we practice the different lines of motion. So a completely different set of muscles. And if I just turn around here and do that, now I'm using the same muscles that I did that. So you may as well turn around there. This one, is that up there? Absolutely. The, the, the Kyokushin Kion, the Karate Kion, is just beautiful for upper body, just muscular development and lines of movement. It's just beautiful. Yeah. Okay, so we're here. And I, I pop the elbow. The reason I pop the elbow is because if I'm, in, if I'm in a situation, a real situation, and they're the sort of person who wants to come in and grab me, I want to pop that elbow. Like, that's all I want to do is like, just drive that elbow in. And if I pop that elbow and they take the head back, boom, bam, then you get the back fist straight away across the eye like that. So the correct technique for Sayuji is elbow leads and flick. Elbow leads, flick. When I say elbow leads, I don't mean it goes all the way over here. It means don't drop your elbow. So the elbow stays up and you flick over right hand. It's knee. Sun, chi, go, go, look, and flicks, comes back once again when you're hitting bone or skin, which is between your bone and their bone, like the nose, the eye, the jinchu, there, places like that, then you want to flick it as much as you can. When you're hitting the body, or which is uraken sayuji, hizoji, but when you hit the body or a, a bigger target, I will do better with this. Okay, it's me, son, she. Good. Okay, now relax the shoulders and bring the hands up. And there's your natural height for Uraki. So, uh, so once again, don't lift it up. What angle is it? Look, we're at 90 degrees. That's the angle. You turn that 90 degrees, you've got 245 degrees, and then there's that. So you keep your wacky clothes and the elbows in. It's a close range technique. That's how close it is. Okay? And from there, you don't want to reach out. If the opponent, if I've got to reach out to Mitch, I'm probably better off throwing a kick at him. Or stepping, I'm sorry, stepping in and throwing. Okay? I don't want to reach out like that. That's the worst thing. Kyokushin guys do is they leave their feet behind and they fall into the technique. Okay, so relax, hands come up and come in 90 degrees, elbows stay close to the body. Once again, don't let the hands touch. They're kind of, they might touch during the process, okay, don't get too pedantic, but you don't rest them on each other. I've actually in fact, I probably did it when I was younger too. I've actually seen guys put their hand on their belt and just rest there whilst the instructors do really? it. Yeah, sneaky. Yeah, sneaky. Okay. So we rotate and flick. Rotate, flick. Hand goes underneath. Rotate, flick. I actually withdraw my hand a little bit. So when I go to hit that side, rather than do it just from here and flick, I'll often go pull it a little bit. To get the build up, and that just comes from having done a lot of makiwara. I tend to find if I flick it from there, it's a fraction of if I pull it from there. Oh, there, like that. It's the sun, 
See, so you see how I'm, I'm doing that. I'll just try to forget that. I'm watching this. See, son, see how my hand comes up a little bit? I'm not saying that's correct. That's the way that I like to do it. It's also how I do it. But for the sake of teaching your students, the most important thing is relax your shoulders, keep the elbows in, and roll in this position. Okay. Roll in this position. How is a good way to use it? Well, I'm here. Quite often, guys grab, and if I let me grab my hand, I'm going to roll out and come back. Roll out and come back. He grabs with this hand. Roll out and come back. That sort of thing. Of course, if he grabs you with that hand, first of all, it's also used to say, you've got your hand in with the other one. With that, guys, question. Yes. Sorry. With the. Uh, way that you do it from the back, you are winding up a little bit and so I'll show you that way. Did you notice you did it that way? Or did I you see did it. that? No, I, I, I noticed it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I noticed a lot of it about Solso's technique because Solso is also always uh, accused of not having the, the most perfect technique. And you put him next to a, a Matsui and, you know, Matsui had the most perfect, beautiful technique. But Solso's technique, every single one of them, you know, would have knocked you out. Awesome. And this is what people used to say. Everything he did was a knockout blow. He'd never win a Carter contest, but if you get in the way of his hand while he's doing Carter, he could knock you out. It's not like, oh, sorry. It's like, dude, yeah. it's calling them. Okay? So, shoulders relaxed, armpits closed. It's me, son, she, like that, good. Okay, and Mawashi. Okay, so we call this Ura Ken Mawashi, which is also Sei Ken Mawashi. The difference is Sei Ken hits with the fist, Ura Ken hits with the back fist. So it actually, Mitch will do it facing the front, and I'll do it to the side. The hand comes from behind, wraps up as much as he can, unwinds, and this hand comes in and flicks towards your own center of your head. I actually got really enthusiastic at training once. And I did it so hard, I split my forehead. <laughs> it was quite funny. It's me, son, sheep, go, go. It's big movement, pull in the arm, forehead. Touch, big movement, forehead. It's me, son. See, this is a difficult one to get for beginners, so what you do is you break it into two. One, two, one, two. Itch, knee, itch, knee, itch, knee. Then I tell them one count for two movements. Itch, knee, son, she, like that. Good. And I uh, Thanks, Mitch. Thank you. So, uh, if you've got any questions about those uraken, I think uraken, uraken oroshi uch. It's uh, oroshi uch wasn't one of the thirty basic techniques. Keep in mind that in the old days, Salsa used to do seventy-five basic techniques. Really? So he'd do all the blocks, and then he'd do the blocks with knife hand, and then he'd do hiji, yoko, ushiro. So. Up, side, back, around. Sometimes we still do that one, two, three, two. But in the 30 basics, it's just this one. Well, Uraken 2, you think about it, that, 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 and that basically cover all the lines of flight. So that's the most important thing. So I know there are some countries that do a lot of things which aren't done at Hombu, but if you ever train with anyone who trained for a length of time at Hombu, I don't mean went to Japan and trained with Salsa at a branch chief camp for a weekend or a week, that's a different thing. I mean someone who trained for a month, two months, three months, six months, a year, two years, or even like uh, Judd and, uh, and uh, Nick, three years. Uh, it's a different thing altogether. Good thinking. There's a lot of techniques in those katas like Oroshi, Hiji in uh, Kanku and so on. Um, and then a lot of techniques uh, in the kata you just don't see in the 30 basics because there's a lot more than 30. But the 30 basics encapsulate all the 
primary lines, primary techniques, uh, and uh, all the muscles of the body. Of course, yeah. So, Stig, if you do that, stick to it. Don't, by all means. But I know at Hombu it wasn't part of the 30 primary Kihon basic techniques. That's the way it went. Arvid, good to see you, man. When you hit in Sayuj, what is the knuckle position? Some people, when they hit, almost hit backwards. Ah, good, very good point. Okay, let's look at that, Mitch. So what happens is, often you'll see guys do this. Ah, hit behind, hit behind. It's too far. You don't want to hit behind. It's his or the hitting to the side. So you hit to there, not to here. I'm glad you brought that up. That was something that has to be with it. So it's there. Me, son, hook, hook, pitch, punch, coup, do. Now sometimes when guys are fast and they're tired, like I said, if they lose the ECG and they start to feel the time available, so then they start to do this, pitch, knee, up, and that's where this backward started when people just got a little lazy, okay? But in my opinion, you better, people go, oh, yeah, no, no, no. we don't do 20, we do 100 of everything. And you see the first 10 is sharp, and then it just goes, mm -hmm. okay? If you want to do 100, this is the way I work with the guys, you do the technique until you start to lose the technique and you get fatigued. Then you rest and do something else. Then you go back to doing that technique, but don't start to do it to the point where you lose the quality of your technique for the sake of being able to say that you're hitting the volume. Like 100%. So doing endurance and sport, there's two approaches essentially. There's a power approach and a capacity approach. And so from a power approach, you do what you just said. You do 10, for example, at the desired intensity. And then next training session, in theory, I'm just making these numbers up, you do 12, and then next set you do 14. And you build up the capacity at that certain given intensity that you want. Whereas a capacity approach is just do 100 and don't worry about the technique. And in theory, you'll get fitter over time. But when technique's involved in endurance or in work, when there's work capacity required at a certain technical level, it's highly debatable if it's good just to do all of it and then come back and fix up the technique. In my experiences, in outside of sport, it's better generally to do a limited amount of high quality work and extend that quality over time. So 100%, and I'm glad I brought that, brought that up, thanks. One of the signs that you'll be lazy and not focusing on quality technique is this. Because you're not using the body, you're not firming up the body, using your legs, relating to the tension, and biting in at the point of impact. What you're doing is you're just letting the range of motion deal with it, and then you kind of come back like this, okay? And it's not on, okay? It's hitting to the side. If someone's behind you, that's what that kicks are good for, okay? Or you turn around and move off and throw the punch that way. When you hit Sayuj, are here. So you mean like this turning that way? Is that what you mean, Arvid? Sayuj, the word sayu literally means left and right in Japanese. We say hidari zenkutsu, migi zenkutsu. Hidari, migi, another way to say hidari, migi in Japanese is sayu. The Japanese have got a, a funky way of playing with their language. So rather than say hidari, migi, they just go sayu. So sayuj means literally to the side. So you're aiming to the side. So it's 100% to the side. You're not turning at all. Stated the side. You're not. You're not turning here and going backwards. You're not turning backwards like that. You're here. You turn, and that's one reason why you lead with the elbow. Arvid. You lead with the elbow in the direction of the technique. Okay. You lead with that elbow in the direction of the technique. If I want to turn, my elbow will lead backwards, and so that's just a, a, a bad habit. And remember, everything we do is dictated by habit. So if you're taught to do something, it's not your fault. It's very much the instructor. And the instructor may be doing 100% of what he thinks is correct as well. But it's just that uh, 
certain habits will sneak in. And one of the worst things anyone can do is fixate on volume over quality. 50, dude, you need to stroll back and see. Mike Clark did 5,000 for being late. Okay. Mike Clark's a few years older than you, Dave. He got on the morning, I was going to say, would have us spend a lot of time doing Kihon Uraki in this way. Jordan, nice. Which way? You mean this way? Here or? Yeah, this this sort of thing. 100%. I find even though this one, his allergy, it's called this one here, we call it his allergy. This is a, a ripper for a surprise shot to someone's head. In, in working doors, one of the best things that ever, and I would never admit to ever do, have ever done it. But I can tell you when I know when it was done, <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing better. Guy throws the back fist right across the face like that. It explodes on their nose. The other one, of course, is Shusky. Let's look at Shusky just to finish off here. I think it's pretty important. One of the reasons it's very important is we call the needle. When I worked with uh, my former Uchi Deshi, who became a pro boxer, he retired Australian light middleweight champion, Tyron Tonga, and he talked about threading the needle from a boxing perspective. Straight up the middle. He wouldn't throw it from here, take it up, and Mitch just takes a stand and stance, and I start to throw the up from here. I start to hit his arms. And that's a really sneaky thing to do because then you thread the needle and it comes up straight. So you see from this angle, I rip, I rip, I rip. And then this one, I literally thread the needle straight up. So from the front, it looks like that. Thread the needle. Now when you do stusky, the worst thing you can do is actually pick it up. It's not necessary. It's not a, an uppercut. It's a rip. So the elbow is hinging on the shoulder anyway. So if you look at my arm, as my shoulder moves, the hand will go up naturally. So that's all you need to worry about. You're not consciously picking it up so much as you just work on threading the needle straight out and the hand will naturally come up. Do we turn, do we not turn? Up to you, whatever your dojo does. If you don't turn, that's fine. It's also would turn the hand just because it'll help to bring the waki in. Like that. So let's go left hand forward. Itch. Knee. Son. She. Now you notice two things. One is I'm threading the needle. I'm hitting to the center line. I'm not going here. Okay. It's so I want the center line. Knee. Son. She. The other thing you'll notice is I'm doing this one a little bit quicker than the others. That's because it doesn't hurt my shoulders or my elbows. <laughs> I mean, really tending with a lot of the basics because my shoulder and elbow are damaged. But this one, it main, maintains the integrity so it doesn't hurt it. It's, notice, straight up the middle. Straight up the middle. Like that. Ushian, what block would you use for that strike? I'm not too, you mean what block would you use to block it or what block would yeah. so to the for the back fist you i would just literally just cover like that or against the back fist it's just this elbows past his hair this sort of thing this movement there covers everything because you don't want to get hit in the neck someone hits you in the neck bang you know you got that carotid sinus, sinus that sterno claim sterno claim door sterno, sterno. Clay to a Yes. And right there is the carotid sinus inside. You get a good whack there. That's why in the old days, the Mashi Getty was called Mawashi Kubi Getty, or the, the roundhouse kick to the neck. Uh -huh. So um, for that block, I'd be doing this. Always, when I'm working and grappling or training, I bring the head back like a turtle. You don't want, it, you, you don't want your head to be available like that. It's back there like this. Boom. Okay, so against the back fist. There, yeah, like that. That usually covers it. That is one drawback of the, the back fist is it's very easy to block because it's coming in this direction. Okay, rather than a punch, it's coming straight. I know there are styles like Tong Long, very powerful Kung Fu style. They do these cross 
movements and they're very good at it. The pox sow, they'll come up here and this sort of movement, very powerful. There are ways to deal with that as well. So um, against a back fist, if I'm here and he throws a back fist, but this one doesn't matter. Boom, I'll just be covering with both hands up like that, covering them like that. The other thing I'd be doing is if he throws a back fist, I'd be covering and then I'd be snapping down and getting in close because my head here neutralizes his back fist now. He's not going to get in back fist. What can he get to with here? Pretty well with that. That's all. So I just monitor that and I can pull it around here like this or come under here, get it like this, bang, bang. Or if I just want to go single leg, I can actually trap that hand in as well and go double almost like that. So if you watch, let's go here like this. I don't want trouble, sir. Boom! I just cover up and drive my head in. That's the only thing now I have to worry about. He's not going to bite me on the top of my head. That's the thing. So I just have to worry about that. So if I can capture that, that's great. Capture here, two hands. See that? And I've got Mitch will con confirm that I'm really pushing with my head here. Yes. And I want to get in. It's also I even used to do this. Grab the hand and lift it between the legs. Instead of flying that way. He showed me a flip of yeah. shot lighting traveling. Yeah. yeah. He, he, there's um, different ways to use that. So Salsa would do that, would he? Just grab that and... Salsa, one of Salsa's standard techniques against a double punch. Left, right, one, two, three, and boom! <laughs> That's crazy. Knock down, knock down the first one, pick up the second one, and then headbutt. Boom! And this hand would go right through here, and if you have a look, I've got Mitch's hand there. See that? Look, stand up, Mitch. I've got his hand between his legs. So he bang, pick up like that. Wow. Yeah. He probably calls it the bitumen kiss. Because <laughs> on a footpath, the first thing that's going to hit is yeah. that horror there. Okay, thank you very much, guys. Mitch, it's always great. Oh, thank um, you. To have you uh, along. I hope you enjoyed that. Hope you get something out of it. I appreciate your um, patronage, especially the Patreon look. You know. I don't even remind people to subscribe, but please subscribe. Help me grow the channel as much as we can. I want to get up to, uh, um, oh, I'm not greedy, so any more than two, three million. I was going to say billion. Okay, yeah, let's go for a billion. Right now I'm on about a one and a half thousand. <laughs> anyway, I don't even, please subscribe, hit the bell, all that sort of stuff, get the notification. Um, Patreon family, uh, you've been, the more I think about it, uh, more appreciative I am because you don't have to, but you do. So I really appreciate that. The Polish language edition. Matus, you might be interested in this. The Polish language edition of my book, the transcript is complete, and we're just going through final uh, checks, final um, proofreading, and we're going to try and get that Polish version out as soon as we can. If you haven't got a copy of my book, Go to my website, just look up Cameron Quinn Kokushin. Um, go to my website, you'll find it there. Grab a copy. Uh, I'm getting great feedback. Um, yeah, it's such, you, Mike. such a great book. I, I would suggest like athletes I work with and to, I don't know how many do, but to, to read it, to get exposure to it. I think so much in it is so important, especially in the world we're in today. Just those strong philosophical foundations. Are, Matus, good, Dave. Us, good to see you, man. I, I miss you, and uh, I'm coming up to uh, Tromsø in Norway for a seminar late June, so I hope we can sort something out with the Lurens Club guys. Yep, good on you. Thanks, guys. Us, Us. thank you, everyone. Us, Us. Thanks, Us. Thanks, Us. Appreciate it. See you next week. Us.